It's my, uh, it's my pleasure to be here today uh, to give the uh, uh, annual Hyman P. Minsky lecture. Um, Professor Minsky was a, a source of many provocative ideas during the course of his professional life, and I, I think those ideas are going to become even more important to our profession moving forward. What I'm going to talk about today is the limits to monetary policy. So let me give you, start by giving some backdrop in terms of how monetary policy works in the United States. I'm sure most, this will be uh, familiar to most of you, but uh, just a level set uh, in terms of where we're coming from. So monetary policy in the United States gets made by the Federal Open Market Committee, meets at least eight times a year. And at these meetings, the 12 presidents of the various re re uh, regional reserve banks, uh, including Minneapolis and St. Louis, among others, um, attend, as well as the, uh, the members of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Currently, there are five of those. Usually, there, there are seven. We're up to full capacity. Um, the committee itself doesn't consist of that large group. It actually consists of the Board of Governors and the President of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, and then four other presidents that rotate on, on an annual basis. Uh, currently, the presidents of Cleveland, Atlanta, Richmond, and San Francisco are, are uh, the other members of the committee this year. So what is a committee trying to do when it gets together to formulate monetary policy? It's been set a statutory agenda by Congress. It's called the dual mandate. And that dual mandate, uh, as befits its name, has two pieces to it. It's to promote price stability and to promote maximum employment. Now, the FOMC released a uh, statement in, um, in January it's just a short one-page statement, which I think is a very important one, uh, articulating principles underlying its long-run goals and strategy in terms of pursuing these two, two objectives. And one of the things it says in that, that January uh, statement is that it views these objectives, promoting price stability and promoting maximum employment, as generally complementary to one another. Okay? That doing one, trying to keep, uh, keep prices stable, is going to help you keep uh, uh, employment maximal. Okay, so that's the, the backdrop of what the FOMC is and how it works to, what, what the, its goals are that have been set down to it by, by the Congress of the United States. So how is it doing? So let's go back to 2007. Now, why do I say 2007? Well, the Great Recession is generally, uh, generally, it's dated by the National Bureau of Economic Research as having begun in December of 2007, so in the fourth quarter of 2007. The National Bureau of Economic Research dates the recession as having ended in June of 2009. So we've been in recovery now for, for, nearly, for nearly three years. Now, since the, the uh, uh, fourth quarter of 2007 through the fourth quarter of 2011, average inflation has been around 1.8%. So it's very close to the Fed's target of 2% per year. But employment is much lower now than it was four years ago. So employment at the end of 2007, in December of 2007, uh, uh, the fraction of the population over the age of 16 that had a job was 62.7%. Now that fraction is 58.6%, so much lower. I, I think it's safe to say the Fed is clearly doing well on its price stability mandate. It's keeping inflation near its target of 2% per year. Why, then, does its performance appear to be so much worse on the other mandate? And what I'm going to do today is suggest, suggest an answer to this question in the context of a model. So first, I have to, uh, before going any further, I should say, I, should, I have a disclaimer. Um, I'm not speaking for others in the Federal Reserve System, uh, including my, my uh, colleagues who, who join me at FOMC meetings. And I want to thank... Uh, Dave Fettig, uh, Terry Fitzgerald, Jenny Shoppers, Rob Scheimer, and Kamu Yi for helpful comments um, uh, without in any way uh, um, <laughs> blaming them for any of the mistakes in, uh, in thinking that, it, that will follow. Okay. So this is going to be the, 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 con the, way, the way this, paper is, uh, this model is going to work and that my, uh, this talk is going to work. The starting point for my analysis is that the economy was hit by two distinct kinds of demand shocks in 2007. The first kind of demand shock is a shock to labor demand. And as we're going to talk about at some length, 
firms demand for workers how many people they want to hire and how many, how, many, how many hours they want to use those workers for is shaped in large part by the real wage. And when the real wage is high, firms demand relatively fewer workers. When the real wage is low, they demand more of them. What's happened, though, since 2007 is at a given real wage, firms now demand fewer workers than they did in 2007. The second kind of demand shock that's hit the economy is one to product demand. So that at a given real interest rate, and I'll talk about how real interest rates affect uh, households' demand for, for goods in a given, at a given point in time later in the talk. But for now, I think the main thing I want to communicate is that given the real interest rate, households now demand fewer goods than they did in 2007. And so these are the two kinds of shocks that I'm going to be uh, modeling later in the, uh, throughout the presentation. And what's, I think, um, somewhat novel, uh, uh, certainly not unique, but somewhat novel about what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to include both of these kinds of shocks in my analysis. It's more typical to emphasize one at the expense of the other. I'm going to include both. Both of these shocks work to generate reductions in employment, falls in employment. A labor demand shock is one source. If firms are not as willing to hire workers as they once were, that's going to generate a, a reduction in employment. One of the things I'll be emphasizing is that that fall in employment will be magnified if it's hard for real wages to adjust downward, if, there's some, if there are impediments to the adjustment of real wages. So that's going to be one source of reductions in employment is an adverse demand shock to labor, that is an adverse labor demand shock. And then the, uh, then the other piece is the product demand shock. And the product demand shock is also going to generate a fall in employment. So inside of this model, monetary policy can offset the jobs impact of the product demand shock. It is effective at doing that. It cannot offset the jobs impact of the labor demand shock or any associated slow real wage adjustment. Okay, so that's, those are two lessons. One is about monetary policy, what it can do. And it can offset the jobs impact of this uh, adverse product demand shock, but it cannot offset the jobs impact of a labor demand shock. The third point is going to be that other forms of policy, non-monetary policy is going to be this, you know, everything else that everyone else gets to do, and that is going to has the ability to offset the jobs impact of a labor demand shock, but only if monetary policy helps, only with the support of monetary policy. So it will require additional easing on the part of monetary policy in order for non-monetary policy to be effective in offsetting the jobs, the negative jobs impact of a labor demand shock. So those are going to be the three uh, lessons that are going to come out of this particular model. Now, inside of the model, we, we, I've talked about how the Fed's mandate, the dual mandate, is to promote price stability and maximum employment. But the model has, has something to say about what maximum employment means. So I talked about this this uh, January statement that the Fed released describing its long-run goals and its strategy. In that uh, statement, the Fed uh, articulated that its target for inflation over the longer run is 2%. It did not articulate a concrete objective for that corresponds to maximum employment. In the side of this model, it would be very challenging to articulate such an objective. It's because Acting alone, the Fed can't offset the impact of an adverse labor demand shock. So what does that mean? That means if there's been an adverse labor demand shock, the highest level of employment, lowest level of unemployment, that the Fed can achieve through monetary policy alone, that maximum employment has fallen. So the maximum employment in the economy, from the point of view of the Federal Reserve, depends on what kind of shocks are affecting labor demand. So connections. So some of you, some of you, this will be interesting. Some of you won't. Just tune up for two slides if you don't really want to know about connections to economics literature. Um, this ties back to a long line of disequilibrium modeling 
um, goes back to, 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 to work by Malambo, Cohen and Hickman, but there's a host of others I'm sure, I know that are, that are involved in this. That basically, these are models that try to nest two types of unemployment at once, so-called classical unemployment and so-called Keynesian unemployment. And it's their language, not mine. These concepts were going to end up having rough analogs in my model. That classical unemployment, classical unemployment here, it's going to correspond to the employment shortfall due to slow real wage adjustment. And Keynesian unemployment is going to be the employment shortfall due to high real interest rates. So it links back to this uh, a long line of literature, but you'll notice the, the last paper I cited in this literature is 25 years old. And so there's, there was a stopping point to this line of work. But more recently, there's been, been uh, some papers that have picked up on this again. Um, so there's a bunch of academic work talking about labor demand and how adverse financial conditions and shocks to financial market conditions can end up being an adverse labor demand shock. I'm citing Quadrini and Perry because of uh, the connections to the Minneapolis Fed, but there's a host of other, other papers along these lines. In his uh, very nice uh, book that he wrote on, uh, on unemployment and labor markets, Rob Scheimer talks about how to understand unemployment, the behavioral unemployment. This is even before the crisis. You're going to have to think about real wage rigidities. And then Bob Hall, and this is Bob's work in his presidential address for the American Economics Association, this is probably the paper that motivated me the most to think along these lines. He models the labor market impact of high real interest rates. And like Hall's uh, analysis, I'm going to be using an explicitly dis disequilibrium model, not a so-called New Keynesian model or a search model. OK, so now you can come back in. If you, <laughs> if you weren't interested in economic literature, now you can come back. Because um, now I'm going to be, I'll, I'll describe where I'm going to go. I'm going to talk about the labor demand shock, what it looks like, talk about a product demand shock, what that looks like, and then I'll talk about how the limits to monetary policy immediately fall out, really, of thinking through what these shocks are. I'll talk about other policy responses, and then I'll make conclusions. And for the, some of you, this is uh, the part you'll be waiting and hoping to get to, and for others, you're, you're, you're thinking of horror of getting here. <laughs> you, we're not going to get here. <laughs> But for those of you who are interested online, there's, there's a, a, an appendix of slides referring to the, math, the model math that would underlie all of this. Before I, but even before I get started, I've, I've got all these before I get started things. What are real wages? I've already used this term. Real wages are actual wages divided by the price index. So in terms, it's an attempt to capture how many goods you can go and buy with the wages you're paid as a worker, as opposed to how many dollars you're getting. And in particular, when we uh, take actual wage growth, the wage growth that uh, you experience, and, it, and adjust it for inflation, the impact of inflation, the uh, changes in purchasing power, that's going to be called real wage growth. So this is an attempt to correct for the effects of inflation on wages. Similarly, the real interest rate is the actual interest rate that you see out there in the marketplace, net of inflation. So again, it's going to be uh, an attempt to correct for the impact of inflation. A lot of things that's going to be true in my, uh, my model is that the Fed controls current and future and real interest rates. That's going to be by assumption. On a minor assumption, um, I'm going to be assuming there are no income effects on labor supply. Uh, these effects are usually estimated to be small. I'm going to, to uh, take the, take, take, take the uh, step of assuming them to be zero. OK, labor demand shock. So this is uh, uh, the, uh, a starting point that for a given real wage, firms now want to hire fewer workers in 2012 than they did in 2007. Why is that? There are a lot of reasons for that. So I'm going to talk about uh, several of them, and I'm sure, sure there are people in the room who come up with others. One of the things I think is very important is the connection between financial market conditions and the fall in labor demand. Okay. There's been a, and so let's talk about one of these. What's one thing that's happened in the wake of the decline in housing prices and housing values and the decline in equity values is that households now have less net worth. And one of the ways that you start up a new firm is by putting some of your own capital into it, some of your own uh, investment into it. Now households have, have less resources enable, to, to, to enable them to do that. So it's harder to start up a new firm 
And young firms are important sources of employment growth. So you look at the data on, 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 on uh, new firms um, being started, and it's basically collapsed since, since 2006, even, even before the recession. And that's going to make it harder to get. Uh, they're an important source of employment growth. And so this, this fact alone means that there's going to be a decline in labor demand at a, at a given real wage. A more subtle influence, I think, that, uh, is that right now, corporate profits are very high, a near all-time highs, in fact. And this suggests that product market competition has declined. Now, why, why, why does that matter for labor demand? When firms have more market power, that is, the, the, they have uh, product market competition is, is lessened for them, they tend to change, the way they react to that is they charge a higher price for their goods. When they charge a higher price for the goods, there's less demand for it. Why do they do that? It's because they're going to make more revenue. By charging the higher price, the, uh, it, it's true, demand falls, but the higher price makes up for the fall in demand. So a fall in product market competition drives market prices upwards and leads then to a fall in output among the firms, and then for, for a fall in how much labor they're going to demand at the given real wage. Now, where did this, this decline in product market competition come from? Well, I think there's a bunch of different stories you can tell that are more sophisticated than the ones I have here. But uh, we hear this from people we talk to, that reset the recession eliminated firms. And that leaves uh, uh, survivors have more market power as a result. That there's less competition facing them. At the same time, there's less competition from entrants. Why? Because it's harder to start up new firms. So less startup activity is also going to mean there's that uh, uh, less product mar market competition. Both of the so whatever you think the reason is for the decline in product co market competition, that's going to lead to a decline in labor demand. One of the things you hear a lot of talk about if you talk to to to, to owners of firms or uh, uh, many or other sources for that matter, is the emphasis on uncertainties. And one kind of uncertainty that gets a lot of emphasis is firms now see adverse financial shocks as being more likely than they did in 2007. Um, as firm owners like to say, they lived through 2008. They know what that was like, and they don't want to go through it again. What that means is they don't want to have to risk the possibility of having to fire a bunch of workers they just hired. So this shock in 2008 also is a retardant on labor demand. The increase in uh, federal public debt, uh, firms are, remain concerned about the possibility that that's going to lead to an increase in taxes um, on, on the corporate side. And um, they, they remain concerned about possible increases in regulation. So these are also going to be, if you think about hiring as being a dynamic decision that might last for, for several years, the, the possibility of the future uh, increases in taxes and regulations can also be a deterrent to, to labor demand. As I said, these are just four, poss uh, four, four uh, uh, sources of a fall in labor demand. And as I said, I'm sure people, people can come up with others. Where, so where, where does it take us, though? So we have these, um, uh, all these things move in the same direction inside this, this picture. So this picture, if you took uh, first year micro uh, economics at, a, at the undergraduate level, um, Actually, probably now, uh, <laughs> high schools have gotten so advanced in the way they teach economics. Probably even in a high school, you'll have seen a picture like this. What does this represent? This is the labor market, the picture an economist would use to think about the labor market. On the vertical axis is the real wage, and the horizontal axis is employment, labor, quantity of workers. Let's start for, what, is, let's, what do these lines represent? Let's start first with this line. This is LS, stands for labor supply. What that means, refers to is, it's a depiction of how many people are willing to work at a given real wage. So when we're down here, when the real wage is low, relatively few people are willing to work. When we're up here, more people are willing to work. I've drawn this with a positive slope to represent the fact that having a higher real wage, more likely to get you to work. I've drawn it, one thing to emphasize though, is I've drawn it with a very steep slope. So it's close to being vertical, close to being a straight line like that. That matters a lot. And the reason is that it takes a very big movement in real wages to get people not to work when you have such a steep slope. And that matches up with 
estimates that we have uh, in the data. To ha it's, good, it, it's empirically um, a good uh, estimate, uh, approximation of the data to have a, a slope as steep as our depict here. That's going to stay fixed. Labor supply is just going to look like that. I'm not going to say anything more about it. What's more interesting and more important from our point of view is what's happening with labor demand. So labor demand depicts the demand, how many workers, firms are willing to hire at a given real wage. And as, as I told you earlier, when real wages are high, they don't want to hire as many workers. That's why I've drawn this with a, a negative slope this, uh, in this direction. So this is what labor demand looked like in 2007. Now, five years later, this, uh, I've just described to you how firms don't want to hire as many workers at any given real wage, and so I've drawn this curve to depict that. Labor demand has shifted in. And it's just a way of capturing that fewer workers are now demanded at the same real wage. Okay. Now, what does this W07 and L07 represent? That represents the real wage and the quantity of labor that creates equilibrium in this market. That would lead the amount of labor supplied to be equal to the amount of labor demanded. And so this is what things look like in, in 2007. If labor markets adjusted uh, uh, readily and effectively to the, to the shock of the fall in labor demand, then we would move to this point down here. But I haven't highlighted it because, uh, as I'm going to explain in a second, I don't think we moved to that point. Okay, so that's the adverse labor demand shock as modeled in a, in a, in a simple micro model. Now, now I'm going to talk about real wage adjustment. As I, as I said here, we should fall down to this real wage. So um, here is all the way over there. It should be that real wage there. But there are a lot of forces in the economy that make real wage adjustment relatively slow. Firms face a number of internal impediments, first of all, to changing real wages. They have existing workers. They want to keep on. And it's, it's costly for a number of reasons, uh, for, for morale and other reasons, to think about cutting the real wages of those workers. But that then makes it hard to cut the real wages of new hires as well. In, in, other, in some industries, and this is certainly not uh, universal in the United States, there are external impediments as well to cutting real wages um, through, through uh, um, for, reason, for collective bargaining reasons, for, for, um, for minimum wage reasons. But these are, that's going to be affecting a relatively small portion of the economy. These internal impediments, I think, are, are much more important. That's going to give rise to even lower employment. So I'm going to depict that here. Here's my, I got rid of the 2007 picture. It's ancient history now, so I keep it around. Here's the 2012 labor demand, labor supply. This is where we should go in terms of uh, where uh, supply and demand are equalized in this market. And I'm going to mark that amount of labor, I'm going to call it LFE. And that's going to stand for full employment. That's where we would be if the if labor markets were clearing. But there's a floor on the real wage that's at any point in time. It's just telling you it's slow for the real wage to adjust. And that real, keeping real wages at that level means that firms are not willing to hire as many workers. And that's going to be, I'm going to call L Fed max. And this is what the novel, I'm told the novelists call uh, foreshadowing. <laughs> this is called Fed Max is going to mean something later in the talk. But so this, this having real wages not being able to fall below this point means that uh, if real wages are there, that's going to be how much, how much employment there's going to be there. So that's all on the labor demand side shock, the labor demand shock. What about on the product demand shock? So I told you that at the beginning there was two shocks, labor demand and product demand. So first of all, let's get, get our minds set about real interest rates. So when the real interest rate is high, people buy less. Uh, given them a certain amount of wealth, people buy less and save more. Why? Because they want to take advantage of those high yields. They want to, they want to, want to put more money away to, get, to take advantage of that. When the real interest rate is low, they buy more and save less. Things that when you can't get much of a return, might as well spend your money. And for uh, what it, what's true in the data is that for a given real interest rate, people demand less consumption in 2012 than they did in 2007. Why is that? Well, this is, this is uh, the kind of, uh, uh, the, the first kind of shock is less talked about, I would say, in, in, uh, in um, public discourse. Well, this one uh, in, 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 is often talked about. And, 
basically, uh, households have lost a tremendous amount of wealth due to the fall of their housing values and equities, and that's going to lead them to consume less at any given real interest rate. They have less, less wealth, you're going to spend less. More subtle effect is that people are now, five years after uh, 2007, people are still very worried about the possibility of losing your jobs. Uh, given that you might lose your job, might lose your source of income, you might think you might have to have a better buffer of savings in order to insulate yourself against that. So you'll see households trying to do more self-insurance. That's going to be a force retarding consumption, demanding products today, and instead generating household savings. At the same time, the fall in housing values in particular, the loss of collateral, means that households, uh, and, and more generally I would say, households face tighter access to credit. That's going to be another force that's going to impinge downwards on how much product demand they'll be have at a given moment in time. So these are all, uh, I think, very intuitive kind of reasons why you would see low product demand for a given real interest rate. So how does that show up? So now I'm going to be drawing a different graph. And this is going to be a graph for the product market, not the labor market. This is the real interest rate on the vertical axis. And on the horizontal axis, I have quantities again. But now it's not labor, it's output. But the two pictures are not disconnected. They're, in fact, intrinsically connected to one another. So forget about the, the, the diagonal lines here and just think about the vertical lines for a moment. This, uh, the one to the right, YFE, it's called that because it links back to LFE. This is the amount of output you, uh, that would be produced if we were at full employment. This, on the other hand, is the amount of output that would be produced if we were at LFED max, the, that, that amount of labor associated with the floor on real wages. That's how much output we would get at that level. Okay. So those are coming from the previous picture. And, that, and the, the, that's, that's how the labor market gets connected back to the product market in, the, in, the, in, this, in, this, in this model. Now, what's, this is the demand for output as a function of the real interest rate. As I told you, demand for products is declining as a function of the real interest rate um, at any point in time. But what's happened is, at any given real interest rate, people now demand less. So take a, take a line for any given real interest rate, people now demand less, and that's going to lead to this curve, YD12, the demand for, for products in 2012. So that's the adverse product demand shock. Now how does this connect back to, to the Fed? Well, now we're going to see how it connects back to the Fed. It connects back through the Fed's control of the real interest rate. The Fed controls that re the real interest rate. Its choice of R determines where we lie. Its choice of R is going to determine where we lie on this demand curve. And that's going to determine how much output is going to be, uh, and, and, and thereby how much employment there is in, so uh, in the society. So here we are. I don't need to go back. I'm going to go forward. Here's the real interest rate that the Fed has picked that translates through a demand curve, through the demand for output, into a certain level of output, Y bar. Okay. That in turn translates into a certain level of labor. So this L bar is the amount of, of workers firms need to produce that amount of labor that we, that, excuse me, that about output Y bar. So we had an amount, amount of output Y bar here. And then I'm just going to translate that back into the labor market in terms of how many workers we need to produce that. And that's that amount L bar. Real wages are going to be determined to, to be basically, and I won't go through this in any detail, but basically firms are going to be uh, bidding down prices, given how low demand is for their goods, firms are going to be bidding down the prices for those goods so that the real wage is elevated up to this level, above W floor. Okay. So that's the relevance of the real interest rate. The, real, the, the, uh, the Fed will pin down the real interest rate. That will then determine the amount of output demanded by households, and that will then, in turn, uh, d d uh, determine how many workers are hired. Okay, so that's the ingredients. We've had a shock to the product to, to labor demand. I talked through in some length. Had a shock to product demand. Now we're going to think about uh, the limits to monetary policy in responding to these two kinds of shocks. So by lowering R, monetary policy can, can increase output. So let's uh, see how that works. Here we were at the, the real interest rate I had drawn earlier here at Y bar. 
Now we're going to drop the real interest rate. That's going to lower, excuse me, uh, lower the real interest rate. That's going to increase the demand people have for goods. So what's going on? The Fed lowers the real interest rate. People figure, boy, I'm not getting anything in my savings accounts, so I might as well spend. That's what the that's what this is going. That's what's going on here, and that spending generates more demand for firms' product, and that leads to hire more workers. I've drawn this so that output goes up to, to Y Fed max. The, the Fed drops the real interest rate enough to, to, to raise output to, to Y Fed max. And the, correspondingly, in the labor market, the real wage is going to fall, and labor is going to rise up from L bar, where it was stuck before, to L Fed max because of the increase in the real interest rate. Excuse me, the decrease in the real interest rate. So that's the impact of monetary stimulus in the labor market. Now here's the key issue in this model. The Fed can't lower the real wage below this floor, W floor. It cannot lower the real wage below this uh, lower bound on the real wage. Because it can't do that, there's no way to get firms to demand more workers than this L Fed max. If you can't lower the, the firm, the, if the Fed can't lower real wages, it was a real wage, a barrier on the real wage to how the firms are able to adjust real wages. If they can't lower the real wage below this point, W floor, then they cannot raise labor above L Fed max. Lowering R can't raise Y above Y Fed max, and lowering R can't raise L above L Fed max. The Fed's notion of maximum employment is pinned down to be L Fed max, which may be less than full employment. So this is a, a barrier to Fed policy, this floor on the real wage that can't be solved, the, the, the Fed can't get around. And so this means that this is the, the most labor that the Fed can, can hope to get at, 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 a, at, a, at a point in time. So that's the limit to monetary policy. Monetary policy can't generate boost labor beyond L Fed max because to do so would require the real wage that firms are, 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 are having to pay to workers to be lower than that floor on real wages. Now, can mon and non monetary policies help with this problem? What we're going to see is the model is going to imply that there's two types of policies you can think about, product demand stimulus and labor demand stimulus. And product demand stimulus policies really can't do anything beyond what, in terms of boosting labor beyond L Fed max, uh, the, the, Fed ma the, the, the max employment for the Fed. Labor demand stimulus policies can, but only if you have the help of monetary policy. So for example, what's a product demand stimulus? Well, buy, the government could go out and buy more goods or could reduce sales taxes. That would stimulate more um, um, a demand for products today if you reduce sales taxes. For a fixed real interest rate, such a policy is going to increase output. So you can see that in this picture. Here's our bar. And for, if you fix that real interest rate, the Fed keeps the real interest rate fixed. Uh, increased demand for, pro for, for, uh, for, for either because of uh, reduction in sales taxes or, or an increase in, in government spending, government purchases, you're going to get an increase in output. That'll translate into an increase in demand for employment as well. So, but there's a limit to what can be done. This is coming again. Where, where does Y Fed Max come from? It comes from the fact that you can't lower the real wage below that floor on real wages. And once that's th this, pro this particular, these uh, stimulus programs of stimulating product demand don't change that. On the contrast, if you go to the labor market and stimulate labor demand, then uh, policies that stimulate labor demand can raise uh, L Fed max, the maximum amount of employment that the Fed can achieve. So subsidies for hiring by firms, for example, would take this effect. You can see that kind of policy is going to increase the, if I tell firms that I'm willing to pay uh, them uh, a, a dollar for every worker they hire, just to take something very nominal, um, 
that's going to increase the number of workers that are willing to hire any given real wage, including the floor on real wages. That's going to boost the amount of workers that, there, that is now associated with that lower bound on real wages, that the floor on real wages. And it's going to increase the amount of, of labor then from LFED max to LFED X prime associated with that floor. So hiring subsidies can increase LFED max, but that doesn't do anything to employment by in and of itself doesn't raise employment. All right? Because what it's what that's going to do All that does is raise Y Fed Max to Y Fed Max Prime. If I keep R bar the same, suppose I had R bar set so that I'm at the, the maximum amount of output, and I try to, I, I, I just I do a hiring subsidy program that raises the amount of, of, of labor and the amount of output associated with max, uh, the, the, the achievable of monetary policy. The only way to actually achieve that is if monetary policy helps out to accommodate. You'd have to lower the real interest rate in order to get to this Y Fed max prime. If I stay stuck up here at R bar, I'm going to stay stuck in, at this level of output and at the associated level of labor. So that I can wrap up at this point. I, I guess I'll say one, one quick word about this. I, I'm probably going to repeat myself one more time on this. The point of what, 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 in this side of this model, what I want you to take away from this is you need two policies to get beyond Y Fed Max. You need a hiring demand stimulus to move the labor demand curve in some way, and you need the Fed to lower real interest rates. You need both of those things to take place. So the, let me go back to, to the motivating question that I started with. The FOMC views its two mandates as generally complementary to each other. But I think over the past four years, the Fed has apparently done better on its price stability mandate than on its employment mandate. And the question I wanted to ask is why? So the model delivers an answer to this. The answer from the model is that the Fed's accommodative policy has offset the impact of the product demand shock. There was a product demand shock. It did lower the demand for product. And the Fed, by accommodating, has offset the impact of that. And that's the actions that have kept inflation near target. Had the Fed not acted in the way it did, inflation would be running well below uh, 2%. But the Fed can't offset the large uh, adverse shock to labor demand and slow real wage adjustment. It doesn't have the ability to do that. And that limitation is what's keeping employment low. In the language of the model, L bar is near L Fed max, but L Fed max is well below LFE. So you remember there were th those three, yeah, just, I can't go back fast enough. There were three labor uh, points on the, on, the, on the horizontal axis in the labor demand in the labor market. One was L bar, that was the lowest. Then there was L Fed max, and then there was LFE. L bar is near there, but L Fed max remains well below full employment. So the policy implication, if you take the model seriously, and this is all conditional on this model, there, there is some who will argue that raising employment requires product demand stimulus, easier monetary policy or increasing government purchases. Others will argue that raising employment requires labor demand stimulus, like cutting taxes or increasing subsidies to firms. This model says they have to work together. Once you incorporate both kinds of shocks, Raising employment above this maximum level achievable by the Fed requires two kinds of stimulus operating at once, labor demand stimulus and monetary easing. Whoops, that's, I promised you I wouldn't do that. So. <laughs> but uh, uh, thanks a lot for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions you might have.